Hello, hello everybody. It is our monthly Q&A session. One of my favorite things to do every month because I get to talk to you and answer your real questions, uh, which is all around anything to do with career transitions, uh, leaving your nine to five job, uh, starting a business leveraging your strengths, or really any questions in terms of preparing uh, for your corporate transition or a life reinvention. Uh, we talk all things here around um, how to take good sabbaticals when you uh, are feeling burnt out. We talk a lot about uh, feelings of change. Hi, Annie from Alaska. Great to see you guys here. If you're watching me live, do say hello in the comments. Uh, and I would love to say hi to you. And of course, if you have any questions today, uh, that's going to, uh, I have some questions that I sort of plucked off from some of the uh, initial um, people that, uh, that, that submitted it uh, via our Facebook page here. Uh, but if there's any questions that I can answer for you today, that's beyond that. Um, feel free to actually um, look at the comments, or sorry, go into the comments and uh, make sure to post a question and I can help answer that on air as well. Hey, Shadi from Canada. Yeah, fellow Canadian. I'm from Vancouver myself. Great to see you here. Shadi, actually, you're going to be one of my first Q&A questions. So we'll put that onto the screen uh, very quickly as well. Uh, so we do do these Q&A uh, monthly sessions every single month on the first week of every month. So if you like the Facebook page, hopefully you do, uh, if you're here, uh, you'll get notified every time. We'll give you usually about five days notice before we do a Q&A. Uh, and then you'll get an opportunity to submit your questions and actually uh, be able to get one of your questions answered on air, which, which is obviously what I'll be doing today. Uh, and of course, if you haven't joined our email list, it's also where we prompt people uh, to ensure that you get to know whenever the Q&A Q and A's go live every month. Just go to screwthecubicle.com. You can sign up uh, there as well. Uh, and we also run monthly webinars. And I'll tell you a little bit about that uh, later on in the stream. And then again, if you signed up for our newsletter or emails, we'll make sure to prompt you or just like this page and we'll make sure to do that here as well. Um, so I get tons of questions all the time. I'm going to put up uh, Shadi's, uh, hopefully Shadi, I'm saying your name right. Uh, Shadi's question on screen here uh, because it is a really, really good question. Uh, because most people ask me this question, what should I be doing <laughs> with my work if I was to quit my job? So uh, Shadi asks, how, do, how to know what kind of work is best for you and how to connect your life points together and have a job you always dreamt about? Um, great question, Shadi. I think this is one of the primary important questions that everyone's asking uh, when they're entertaining the idea of potentially leaving their job to do something independently. Uh, and I'm also going to give you, Shadi, a resource, which is a free training. I'll add that to the comments uh, after I'm done answering your question so that you can do a lot more of a deeper dive uh, of uh, extracting right those answers uh, from your life experience in order to lead you uh, to an idea or a focus of a niche of an idea by repurposing your skills. So um, whenever I answer a question like this, I always talk about um, the best business that you should be starting, or it could be a consulting business, a freelance gig. It doesn't have to be a full, you know, uh, brick and mortar business or anything that you believe you need to invest a lot of money to start. Uh, Service-based businesses are excellent to start with very, very low in, uh, initial investment to start a website and to start offering services as a freelancer, right? Or a consultant uh, or someone that does services, right? Um, Knowing the right business start always is going to come from uh, your ability to understand more about your strengths, right? Uh, you don't want to just start any business out there because, you know, there's tons of great business ideas out there, but not all of those business ideas are for you. Um, what you're going to be best at is going to obviously be what you know how to do, whether it's been done professionally before, right, in a corporate job or anywhere you've been employed, right? Or it could be something that you've actually learned how to solve for yourself. Like a lot of my coaching clients do end up starting businesses that they've never been paid to do before, but they have in some way have real life experience, right? Solving that problem for themselves. And now they feel the inclination to teach it to other people, right? And they can combine skill sets that they've got uh, in their suite of skills in order to produce that business as well. So Shadi, when you think about your work experience, 
it may look like my resume, like my resume looks like it's like for five different people. <laughs> I jumped industries every two years, but you want to find the sort of common thread that may potentially uh, be binding your roles together. So for example, for me, Shadi, uh, I worked in publishing and I worked in hospitality. I worked in um, uh, real estate development. I worked in all sorts of different industries that seem like they don't match. But when I actually looked at each role, right and brainstormed like what did i actually do in that role that i knew i was really good at you know i kept getting compliments around it uh it felt really natural for me to do those things and it made my job um done i did that job really well in a specific way right not in the industry but at the job role uh, and you'll start to notice uh like i did that some of the things i do really well in um is customer facing types of roles right when i was able to match a need right with someone else's desire or their request so i did that a lot in real estate for example uh, and then in publishing it was you know i did a lot of marketing and messaging and storytelling and publishing writing marketing materials for books um, i also did that in a way matching the copywriting right to a need or a mission of that book right for that audience and i was really able to uh, translate uh, big messages or big selling points of a concept uh, to an audience right um, and those are sort of great things to take stock of, like things that are you're good at that not not is always tangible, right? We look at our skills sometimes as things like project management, you know, or accountant or like these sort of job titles. But you, when you actually question yourself on what made me great at that job, what were the qualities I brought to the table? What were the ingredients I brought to the table? Then you'll start to really notice some of these larger themes that actually do appear from role to role. Right. That's the first step is just taking inventory, taking stock of what are the things that are tangible and intangible skills and talents that you possess right now. Right. Just to get an inventory of having these tools available to you. Now, the second step is thinking a lot about how you may potentially be using these skills because skills are just skills. Right. Unless until they're applied to a business or applied to a, a, an idea. Right. So most likely most people's skills are quite transferable if, again, they look beyond the job title and really just see what are the qualities and ingredients they have in their work that make them really, really good. That is very transferable uh, to whatever it is that it's the next thing that they do. Um, the second sort of question is, is around problems that you want to solve. Right. This is a, a much more deeper question that's less about skills, but actually a lot about impact and a lot about um, you know, issues that you actually really want to help with. So, for example, uh, one of my clients who was uh, a financial advisor that no longer wants to work for banks uh, did have a great money mindset. You know, that was an ingredient, a quality of her work. Uh, she, even though she was uh, a financial advisor at a bank, what she really found she was really good at is really helping people feel comfortable around looking at their numbers, you know, not, uh, you know, when people are like, oh my God, I'm so scared, I'm in debt, I'm just like so stressed out and anxious, I feel shameful about money and all that sort of thing, you know, where she did better than other financial advisors in her firm was that she was able to make customers really feel empowered in the way that they manage their money. Now, on an obvious choice, she could have just built a business around financial advising, right, which is something she did sort of take as one of the options. But then when she actually looked deeper into some of the uh, things that are happening in her life, right? Problems that we, we may want to solve um, are already happening around our environment, right? There's things that you care about that's happening in your communities, things that are happening in your family and friend circles, things that are happening in causes that you care about, right? Uh, that you may want to contribute towards, right? And some of your skill sets could actually help with the solutions of those problems. So taking that example from this woman who was a financial advisor, right? When she actually looked at like, what problems does she see in her vicinity that she keeps getting questions around or she feels frustrated that other people seem to have this problem. And one of the things was actually, um, she was, you know, one of the most impactful things in her life uh, was that she raised a, um, um, you know, a, a kid with, with, with absolute, she had a, she had, she had a kid with Down syndrome. So she was raising a kid with special needs and realized that a lot of moms, right, around her were always coming to her for advice around, you know, how to deal with raising a child like that, how to deal with parenting differently, how to deal with um, all the costs that sometimes can be associated with special needs children, you know, and, and they don't they weren't getting as much of the resources, but potentially in their in, in, in the other parts of their uh, world. So 
so she was always the go-to person for that because she was raising a kid that was eight years old at this point um, that did really well, right? She learned all the all the things of what it felt like uh, to raise a kid with special needs. And so how she combined, for example, her financial advising skill with this problem that she really wants to help people get better at. And, and you know, it feels that it's something really um, purposeful for her because she's experienced it as a mother in her life is tacking on to helping mothers that are specifically raising special needs children, right, to be financially savvy in order to plan for special education, right, to plan for special nutrition, uh, to plan for extra help, right, and support, uh, and, and use her background in money to help parents like that to have a much easier way of raising children with potential extra costs associated with it. Right. So that was sort of her focus where she still talked about, you know, parenting tips and sort of how to um, deal with your, you know, your, your child if she, they were having a meltdown in public. Right. Um, and, and but still use her financial skill to really help people manage their money better so that they can have right these sorts of things uh, a lot more easy uh, for them. So that's a really good example of combining a, a really strong skill set. Right. That she has a background in but with an, a, a problem or a cause that she feels really passionate to solve. So Shadi, I'm going to give you a resource that I'm going to just paste in the comments here. Let me just see if I can grab that in my comments. Um, so there it is. I have um, put that down for you there. Um, and, and if you go through this free training, it's going to walk you through what business you should start, like so what questions you should be considering a little deeper than what I just spoke about. Uh, and then there's a workbook, which is called Repurpose Your Skills Workbook, right? Um, and that is a place to start with that inventory stock taking ability, right, of your strengths and skills. And again, Shadi, don't, I know you said you're a dentist, right? Now, even as a dentist, like you might not want to deal with teeth again, potentially, but you might actually have loved a particular type of interaction you've had with customers in the past. You love educating potentially on health, maybe, right? There's sort of so many things that you might have done as a dentist that can be transferable again. And if you think that, well, dentist is quite a niche, like I can't repurpose that as much, you know, that's okay. Look at other areas of your resume. Look Look at actually things that you've accomplished as a personal person, right? Um, and if you want to do something else, as you said, to discover around making people happy and helping them do more exciting things, like, great, like, what is that? It? Is that for women that are millennial women? Are they women at mid-age, mid-career? Are they women that have families, right? Uh, who are these sorts of people? you know, that you may want to help do more exciting things, right? Maybe it's that next chapter of their life. And there might be a particular stage of life of a woman that you may be really called to help. And very likely that woman is similar to you, whatever age group you're in, whatever lifestyle choice that you have, right? It, if that's the thing that lights you up, and let's say you've also been on your own personal mission to do more exciting stuff, to challenge yourself out of the comfort zone, to help uh, gain more courage, right? To do things off the beaten track, off the expectations of cultural society expectations, right? Uh, like what are those issues that women potentially might face around that? Like I know mothers, for example, love to have a next big thing, but they're so focused on their kids, you know? Uh, and I have a client who specializes in, you know, mid-age women that their kids have, uh, you know, empty nesters, right? Left the homes. And now they're like, what now? I've been a mom for so long. I have no idea what I want to do with my life now. And she specifically helps people, to find their next thing, right? Their next chapter, the next project that can have their identity intact without it being just the role of a mom or a wife, right? And that's really, really purposeful to her. And she brings some skill sets of her project management days from real estate and, you know, her great way of organizing ideas and making it chunked down to great bite-sized steps in order to help women do that, right? And make an impact that way. Um, so this is a, a good way for you to look at it, Shadi, and hopefully uh, when you're able to take a look at the training, right, link that I provided, right, everyone who is also watching that would love to know what business to start, how to repurpose your skills into a business idea or a freelance idea, uh, you might want to check out that free webinar and guidebook uh, that I pasted below as well. Okay, that's a great question. Thank you very much, Shadi. <coughs> Sorry for my cough. I'm just getting over a bit of a flu. All right. The second question is about money uh, and an, also an important question because that's also one of our top urgent questions usually that people have. Uh, and this comes from Tom Southerton. Thank you, Tom, for your question. Uh, there's a, quite a number of questions here, but I'll try to sort of wrap it up uh, as much as possible with the key points that I think you're trying to make, make here. Uh, so you're asking about being debt free or financially free. I'm assuming you mean that by do I pay off my debt first? before I start saving money for the future? 
uh, or investing in a business that can help me get more money in the future. Um, and then your second question is leveraging good debt debts for buildings. Um, I'm not sure if you're talking about real estate there. Um, I'm not a real estate specialist, or maybe you mean, um, and again, I'm not a, a, a debt specialist either, but so I'll talk more around the, the concept of, you know, because I've been in debt before, right? A lot in debt before I started my business. So I'll talk a lot more around making those decisions. Um, but I'm not sure about what you mean by building. So you might want to clarify that in the comments and then maybe I'll, I'll, I'll reply back if um, it's after the live session. Uh, and then you talked about startup loans versus bootstrapping, right? What's the minimum cash buffer to make your leap? Uh, do, you, do, do we believe in C or C in belief or do we and do we meet a minimum number uh, uh, or percentage of income before leaving? All right. So the first question around debt free versus financially free. Now, my uh, my idea and, and again, you know, you want to seek financial advice from a specialist as well. Uh, and I always want to be quite transparent with that. The advice I give is based on usually, you know, um, looking at ways of doing things easily from my position uh, and also seeking advice from other financial advisors advisors for my own case, as well as even my clients, what has worked well for people. And, and also, right, the same advice of going to see a financial specialist or a financial advisor to really consolidate your debt. So if you feel that starting a business, for example, is a bit stressful because you believe you have to invest a lot of money into a business or should you pay down your debt first? My advice is actually you can do both, right? Um, because you do want to start paying off your debt so you don't feel that financial strain right? Uh, throughout your life, even if you don't start a business, you should, you know, anyone feeling debt, this is this looming, gloomy thing that hangs around our heads that sometimes prevents us from going after bigger goals because we're trapped in debt, right? And in, in that sense, really trapped in making bigger choices in our life. So we do need to be financially responsible and accountable in getting our financial game to a healthy level. So um, paying off your debt is understanding your numbers, understanding a goal to pay off your debt, like how much can you afford to pay towards your debt? Can, is there some things that can be consolidated? So for example, for me, I had massive credit card debt like years ago before I quit my job, which right helped me back from quitting. Uh, and when I saw a financial advisor the you know, in order for me to pay less interest rates, I had to consolidate my huge amounts of credit card debt into a line of credit uh, payment of a loan, which was a lot lower in percentage of about 6%, right? Versus a 21% interest rate on credit cards. So you want to look at some of your top interest rate loans or debt or credit card loans and be able to consolidate that with a financial advisor or your bank specialist as often as you can to stop paying so much interest rates, right? And then really start being honest and transparent, going through it with a financial advisor of all the things that are non-negotiable for you in terms of your debt. And you might also want to look at things that are negotiable expenses, like, you know, if you cut down um, eating out all the time or spending on really um, like luxurious holidays, right? Those, all those things add to your debt, right? They add to your cash flow of what can be put towards paying off the debt or having a, a, a kick-ass time in Mexico, right? You might actually choose to have a, a smaller holiday, right? A much more um, grassroots, you know, sort of um, local holiday rather than something too extreme, right? In order to pay off your debt. So when you work with a, with a, with someone who specializes in debt management and payments, they can give you a plan on how to pay off your debt according to what you make at the current moment, what you might need to budget and save every month, and what can be disposable income that you can choose to pay a percentage to your debt or to use it as an investment for business. So I would again advise you to consult as financial advisor for, uh, for that, but do the due diligence to actually take inventory of your financial spending, right? Look back in the last three to six months in your online banking, what are the things and categories of spending that you can actually eliminate or eradicate because, you know, it's sort of extra negotiable expenses. And then what is actually non-negotiable, like your mortgage and your rent or your food uh, and like groceries, right? Or the minimum payments on your student loans, right? Like, really know your numbers really well so that you understand what it is that you need to pay down on a bare minimum, right? And how much interest rate you could save if you consolidate. And also, if you were to work with someone that can give you a debt paying, paying down plan, then you have a really clear idea about how long it could take. Even if it takes five years, you know that on a consistent level as, as practice, you should be able to put away this amount every month to reach that goal. And you're really adding that goal of the monthly cost to your monthly living 
um, uh, plan expenses, right? So whatever that, what I call the break even number for every single month. So that will also help you with that question around what's the minimum cash buffer to jump? Because Tom, everybody's safety net or comfort zone of financial security is different, right? So there's no hard and fast rule of like save up six months for, you know, living expenses and then quit uh, because it all, it all de depends, right? It depends on your risk tolerance. It depends on if you have a family to feed. It depends on if you have bigger goals to buy a house and things like that. You have to consider that. And again, talk that out with a financial advisor. Um, but for me, you know, at the time when I quit, I was single. I had a mortgage, but I rented the house out so that I didn't have to pay that mortgage and I can use the rental income to pay the mortgage. And I moved into a smaller home, right? In order to pay, just have less life expenses. And that worked for me. And for me, I knew that I needed to put, uh, uh, put in place, right? Some income generating uh, activities before I quit, for example, being able to freelance and know that I have a contract and a gig that I can work part-time in right? At bare minimum. And I also started a side hustle, which was my, was my business, my first business at the time, uh, nine months before I quit so that I had some of these things going, right? That, that pays off my break even point number, which was about $3,000 a month at the time in Vancouver. And as long as I met that and a little bit more, I felt safe to quit. Plus I used that nine months to really save up money for about six months of living expenses. Cause that was what made me feel comfortable. And that felt like a calculated risk that I could um, easily move into quitting because I've set these assets in place for me. So you'll need to talk to your spouse. You might need to think about your life, right? Of like, how much would it cost if I was to consolidate my expenses, right? Know my numbers well. What feels comfortable for me to leave? And again, on the pragmatic level, you want to start that side hustle before you leave your job. So you have something quite comfortable to slip into or get a freelance gig or a part-time gig that might be remote or taking on projects, right? Uh, that you can work from home in, uh, or contract yourself out for something, uh, and then get some part-time income coming in so that it is in a, in a, in a, uh, you know, a full uh, scheme of like having a couple types of income come in before you quit can help you to feel more relieved, right? In taking the leap and also have that rainy day buffer for you. So majority of people, Tom, that have felt comfortable with the buffer of cash buffer has usually been around six months of living expenses. Now, again, that might differ if you have children and you know lots of things to, to think about, but that's usually the average of what people feel comfortable with. But you should have that answer a bit more clearly after you've, you've sort of uh, worked with a financial advisor. Now, in terms of startup loans and versus bootstrapping, I'm a huge believer in, especially if you have debt, and most people do, is not to get into more debt and add the extra pressure for yourself. That's why I'm a huge believer in service-based businesses because there's not a lot of startup investment that's necessary. You are the asset of the business or the, the, the gig that you're going to do. And so if you can perform a service, you can help with something, you can produce a service, then you can get started uh, really quickly with having a very simple website, you know, Squarespace, uh, for example, is like $12 a month, right? To host a website, and have a beautiful website ready to take on clients. Uh, it's affordable, right? For you to do that. You don't have to pay for a $5,000 website to get started. Most of my clients have a simple one page landing page and they go and actually pitch their services to, you know, people in their community, old colleagues, old bosses, like all those low hanging fruit networks in order to get their first few clients. And that's actually the best way to market. You don't need to be spending money on advertisement. A lot of your work as a bootstrapper and service-based business in the first year will be around word of mouth and you actually getting out there in the context, uh, context you already have, right? You already built lots of social equity, right? With your community and your networks and is to be able to actually start telling people that you're available to do this. Now you're available to help them with this service, right? You're offering your consulting services or your contracting services uh, available now. And that's what I did as well. One of my part-time gigs when I was still working full-time is offering uh, to do social media marketing planning for people because I did do that for my old corporate job, one of my old corporate jobs, and I could give um, a monthly rate to small business owners to help them plan out their social messages every month. And so that was not something that was a forever gig I wanted to do, right? But I was good at it. I knew how to do it. And that brought me some income and allowed me to start um, being more responsible and independent in the way that I was making my own money, right? And I was doing that in conjunction with 
my full time my full time job. <coughs> now, the meeting a minimum number or percentage of income before leaving. Uh, again, this is all depending on what you require to feel safe financially to leave. Everything is a risk, and some people that I know um, would sometimes have quit. You know, with three months of living expenses and they go for it, right? And their high risk tolerance is a lot higher. For me, it was about six to nine months of savings to be able to do that. And I did need to pay at least a minimum. I needed to make for myself because I was living by myself. I didn't have any extra assistant in a spouse to pay rent and things like that. To me, it was a bare minimum of $3,000. If I can make $3,000 a month, I justified the reason to quit. And I knew that I felt safe to quit. Now, before, when I didn't know my numbers really well, you know, I was making six figures at my salary and I always thought I wasn't allowed to quit unless I made six figures as well in my business. And that felt like such a high goal because again, I didn't necessarily look at the numbers properly. What I just assumed is six figures, that's what I make. I have to make the same amount to be able to feel, feel right to quit. But actually, when I actually look at the numbers, um, Canada in taxes, Chadi would probably know this, just Canadian too. Uh, after a certain bracket of income, you get taxed really heavily. Like I was taxed about 40% of my income because I made such a large salary in my, in my, in my uh, corporate job that actually I only got to keep 60% of my income. And after taxes, that amount wasn't actually that much that I was taking home or not as much as I thought it was anyway. And if I actually divided that amount I got to take home with the 60 hours a week I was working to make that salary, I was actually making less than my assistant. So it's what, what a sometimes shocking thing that you can find out when you actually look at the numbers properly and really see like, is my efforts really giving uh, uh, myself the income rate that I deserve or is it just the title and the status of a six figure job that's pulling me in? So that was a great reality check for me to be like, screw the six figure job. I'm not even making six figures really at the end of the day when I took the money home. So that actually propelled me to sort of go, okay, what is actually what I need to, to live comfortably? How can I make that independently on my own? And once I did that, I can then, you know, be able to quit. Right. And that was my safety zone and yours might be different. Right. So, um, I wouldn't look at percentage of income because that's sort of a question that, doesn't really lead you to a bigger thought, which is a much more logical and pragmatic question, uh, will be is how much do you need to live comfortably? If you were to live minimally and actually give yourself more time and space and opportunity to build your goals out, right? Without being strapped to a nine to five, what is that opportunity for you, right? There's an opportunity cost about staying as well, right? When our dreams aren't being met, where another year goes by and we're still sort of save, you know, like, like just, being attracted to a high income, but actually our life doesn't represent the happiness level that we agree on, then what's the point, right? We have to really look at this stuff realistically. Uh, so for me is think about your monthly cost, Tom, and look at, look at it with a financial advisor, talk about it with your spouse if you have one, uh, and really know your break even point, right? And I'm going to also, Tom, after the, the stream, I'll give you a spreadsheet that I, uh, I use to really look at all of my expenses of what income I'm bringing in and, and non-negotiable and negotiable expenses, I can actually start to really list and you'll really start to see how much money you need monthly uh, to be able to live, okay? And that will give you a much bigger number. I'll paste that on the comments after the stream. But that's a great question. Thank you very much for asking that. All right, uh, last question is from Allison. Uh, she says, how do, how do we motivate ourselves when you're a solopreneur? Yeah, great question. And I think, Allison, you've probably been, uh, you know, starting your business for a little while now or, or months, a few months to a year. I've seen you in my uh, unconventionalist group. Uh, and uh, it is a very lonely road being, a, being an entrepreneur and a solopreneur, especially if you don't have people in your circle uh, doing what you're doing. And it can feel sometimes demotivating talking to your friends and family about your business because sometimes they tend to worry you about oh my God, it's so risky. Like, uh, you know, what are you doing now? And, you know, questioning you on a bunch of stuff and then you have no answers for, or you feel uh, a bit shaky yourself, right? In taking that courageous leap. Um, they're probably very likely not the right people to off offload any worries or uh, necessary feedback to. Uh, I think, you know, when you are feeling lonely, especially on a physical level, like some people can make online friends and be part of Facebook groups and business groups and being part of masterminds virtually and feel fulfilled. And, and, you know, with social media and the more uh, virtual um, uh, digital, right. Environments we go in now, uh, we can sometimes feel some of that 
itch be being scratched by belonging to virtual groups, right? So for example, people that are MBN conventionalists or work with me in my masterminds, they have accountability, right, of people that they see every week, and that helps them to motivate themselves as, an, as a solopreneur. Now, if you're someone that's built differently, where you actually need to be physically with people, there's nothing wrong with that. I think in today's world, we need more and more in-person connections because there's so much time we spend behind a laptop, behind a computer. Um, it can absolutely feel more lonely. We're more connected uh, than ever before on a global level, but we're also very disconnected on a, on a, on a, personal level to people we really don't know who we're really talking to we're not really showing up as ourselves on social media right we just show our best selves on social media so it's really hard to be vulnerable and and and, and get support emotionally as an entrepreneur right uh, when you're building something and doing something for the first time so you might want to consider Allison is actually joining co-working spaces you know when I moved to Bali five years ago uh, I didn't know anyone uh, it was like a brand new country a brand new city uh, I was in the tropics it was lovely but then I was like oh, okay after the beaches and the coconuts and all the great things I get to do in Bali I still felt like I didn't have community I didn't have people that I saw regularly I didn't have anyone working next to me I was working in cafes that um, was great but they were all tourists and they weren't actually access Spats or digital nomads like I was. So joining a co-working space uh, really helped me to, now I have the friends for five years now, they're still my friends that live here, you know, and that has been huge in, uh, first of all, keeping me in a tropical island. Uh, but the second thing is actually having this consistency of support and people that are on the same path, don't think I'm crazy for living here, you know, are also building businesses. And that is huge in um, helping me feel motivated and me feeling supported uh, in some of the ups and downs that can happen in all stages of business. So Allison, wherever you live, check out some co-working spaces. You may not need to buy a membership, but go to the events, right? Maybe go twice a week uh, to hang out and work from there. You know, be around some of these people that are like-minded to you in order to, to educate you, to show you things, right, that are... Um, potentially uh, not even in your in your vicinity right now what you know is what you don't what you know and having that perspective change right uh, by meeting other entrepreneurs um, seeing you know what they have accomplished and asking questions is an excellent way to forecast yourself to what's possible we always have to be hanging out with not just people in our stage of business we should be hanging out with people that are ahead of us right because we want to learn from them we still contribute to them uh, but we want to be around all types of people, right? People that are in our stage of business, building similar businesses, and then people that we can look up to, right? People that are two years ahead of us, five years ahead of us. And being around a community hub, like a co-working space, is a really great way uh, to motivate yourself without you being your self-coach, right? And being around people and getting that buzz uh, from other entrepreneurs. Um, now, if co-working is not available in your city, um, join a meetup. Right, Google meetups around your area and join entrepreneurship meetups, join women led meetups, wherever it is that you find uh, common values in, that's what you should be joining. And if you can't find a meetup, organize one. I did that uh, in my, my city in Vancouver when I first started entrepreneurship. I did go to a bunch of meetups, but I really found it was like kind of a um, almost like a, a speed dating networking kind of event and it felt really icky to me and it was like hundreds of people there and I didn't feel again very intimate and personal and to be honest like safe enough to be vulnerable and talk about my beginning part of my entrepreneurship journey back in the day so I decided to actually recruit and curate a small group of women it was six of us to start one of them was my really good friend who was a therapist who had her own um, practice who also didn't have a lot of peers to talk with. Uh, and then I also recruited like uh, you know her friends, right? Friends that she knew and people that I knew from my network and handpicked the right types of women, then come together, hang out in my living room every Friday. We did a structure where uh, everyone hosts, takes turns hosting every Friday, where um, actually whoever hosts has also an opportunity to hold the floor where they teach something or share a tip right? Something around business, something around something they've achieved in order to help the other women in the group, right? And have practice in teaching something. And then we open the floor up to brainstorm and workshopping things that were happening in our business uh, together in a six women group that ran for about six months, right? Before I left for Bali. So if you don't have a group that's available, create one. And I think that's a really great practice for you as well to uh, facilitate something, right? To handpick your peers and <coughs> handpick the right people to join because that makes it a much stronger group 
anyway, um, because uh, these women or men that you curate are going to have the same intention, similar goals, you know, great personalities that can help contribute to the health of that um, a group rather than just take from it. Right. So handpicking people are are really important, especially in a small uh, group as well. Uh, so hopefully, Allison, uh, that was really helpful. And again, if if your questions is related to um, like, you know, you, you may need an expert, for example, to help you feel clear about your business so that you feel more motivated. So let's say you've been trying a few things in your business. Um, it's not working and you're feeling deflated because of it. It's that kind of thing. You're not just feeling lonely. Um, I would recommend a coach, right? Obviously, we all need someone to help us get somewhere faster. And it's also a coach is really great to help to be a mirror for you, right? Especially if it's a coach that has uh, is, has created similar businesses that you're, you're creating, uh, has the same values and approach that you respect, right? You can see yourself trading lives with them if you could. Um, those are the sorts of people that you should be asking for help from. And uh, making that you know, part of your investment of time uh, and money in your business to accelerate yourself to getting to your goals more effectively and choosing the right coach for sure is super important, right? I can, I can do a whole live stream just on choosing the right mentorship. Uh, but you very likely know some of these people already. You might follow them already. Uh, and, and you want to sort of, you know, try to engage with them in order to see whether you might be a good fit to work with them. And that can help to re, uh, re, uh, 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 like re-energize some of your uh, uh, motivation levels in your business because sometimes we fall a bit flat in business when we've been like, you know, really exhausted and trying a bunch of stuff and nothing's working and we need some clear perspective, right? Whether you get it from a mastermind group or a meetup group or a co-working space, you can also get a fresh perspective from coaches that are really focused, right? On your strategy and what you need to do to get going and uh, really give you a sense of zest, renew zest for life for your business when you can take that apart and get uh, a really uh, a non-emotional attached perspective from someone else right? That can really, really help you with that. Okay. Great question. Um, uh, Allison, I uh, hope, hopefully that was helpful to you as well. All right. So that is the end of our Q and a for this session. Thank you so much for joining me. Annie Wee says amazing Bali. Yeah. It's been my home for five years. I can't imagine living anywhere else at this point. Uh, so maybe you heard the roosters, the ducks in my backyard, uh, but that's where I'm at today. Uh, if there's any questions, if you're watching the replay or coming on uh, last minute here, um, um, please give me some questions here. I know Annie, you helped a little bit. Uh, you asked about uh, real estate investing. Uh, I'm not again a real estate investing specialist, so I, I'm I'm sorry to say I can't help with that question. Uh, but you might look at things like Airbnb, right? So um, if you have a home you currently have to be able to rent out, I know a lot of my clients have actually used Airbnb uh, in their current apartment or current home that they have in their home country as income uh, and then moving abroad so that their living expenses are less, right? Like for example, in Bali, my living expenses are a quarter of what I would pay in Vancouver. I mean, that's huge in terms of opportunity. I get to keep more of my money. I don't have to pressure myself so much in living in an expensive city. Um, and my money can you know, do more for me when I live abroad. And so that might be something to consider is renting out the, the place on Airbnb, having an Airbnb side hustle while you go elsewhere and live in a cheaper country, right? And meet other people that might be more like-minded to you than just city folks sometimes. Uh, that might be, you know, uh, a potential resource for you. So uh, if you want to look at places that nomads uh, hang out and live in, Annie, you can go to nomadlist.io and that will give you some uh, top places that digital nomads like me live from. Uh, and a lot of us do have Airbnb properties around the world to generate some monthly income uh, passive income that will help them continue to live abroad uh, or build a business, another business on the side. But as I said, Annie, um, one of the things that I think is a really easier thing to start than investing money right into property is actually um, offer services, right? Offer to actually have uh, to be able to travel like much faster and be able to bring your work with you and to be able to help and do work on the road, uh, having a service-based business can potentially be an option for you. So again, Annie, um, you might want to check out that free webinar and workbook uh, called What Business Should I Start? And that might be able to help you to really look at skills you already have that you can actually generate a, a much more productive business idea around potentially versus right? Investing in real estate and having to learn some new things there, which could be, again, a brick and mortar thing. You have to go go there and, and sort of, um, you know, take care of that place, right? Uh, anything that happens, you need to have someone that's available to deal with that real estate property. Uh, and it's less mobile, 
in a lot of ways sometimes. But, um, you know, something that you might want to think about, right, in Airbnb, but also think about other options, right, that you could potentially be creating a business around that might be a little bit more location independent, uh, might even be uh, something to start, right? Um, yeah, you know, Annie, like you talked about renting a home in, in a spot like Bali and renting the room out, like, yeah, totally. Lots of people do that. You know, you, you rent it on a one year lease, get a better price, uh, and then rent out the, the room downstairs, right. Or something like that. Lots of really cool ways to do things like that abroad, right. I've got friends in Spain that do that, right. They have a two bedroom apartment, uh, and they rent out the other room half the year. And then they rent out the whole entire apartment for the other six months when they go out and travel. And that brings in some income for them as well. Uh, so some really cool ideas there, Annie for sure. Um, all right. So if I can help you with anything, uh, or you have any other questions of what I spoke about today on the Q and a, please comment below and, uh, make sure to tag us. And so that I can come back and help you answer that. But as I said, we have these Q and a monthly calls every single month. So if you like the page, you'll be able to, uh, subscribe here and we'll let you know the prompts for it as well. Uh, the other thing I wanted to share as well, uh, which was actually back to Tom's question around finance, which I forgot to put down, uh, I'm going to say for Tom, uh, which is the baby steps from Dave Ramsey's financial uh, course, which you can do a free email course with him. And Dave Ramsey is a great influencer in the States um, that helps people pay down debt, right? Because you talked a lot about debt, Tom. And this is more of a better specialist can help you with some of those steps to consolidate and be a little bit more financial, financially accountable to your debt plan of paying that off. So that was a resource for you. A few of my clients have gone into the Dave Ramsey program uh, to help with debt repayment. So this might actually be one of the resources for you. Uh, so next week, I'm going to be posting this really quickly after I end this Q&A call. Next week, we're going to be having same time next week, we're going to be having a live um, uh, live training, right? A live learning uh, that is going to um, um, and again, this is something we do every month. Uh, it's really going to help you uh, again, a lot about some of these questions we have. I'm going to post a topic for that, um, uh, after this live stream so that you can sign up for that as well. But that's where you can spend probably about an hour with me next week. And we're going to drill down some of these, uh, key questions around career transition, uh, and starting a business and really figuring out what is your expertise and being really good at work so that you don't have to have this notion of having to escape work all the time and actually like start to create great work so that you actually want to work and you actually want to build an asset in your career uh, instead of actually trying to always run away from work, right? Work has sometimes been a bit of a dirty word uh, from our sort of tainted experiences in corporate, but it doesn't have to be that way. We can absolutely be using work, work as a way of contribution, a way of expressing ourselves creatively, uh, and also uh, a way of purpose, right? Which is something that we seek for as humans. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that next week. So I'll post that on there. You can get a reminder on the on, on the scheduler when I post that uh, and join us live next week for our webinar training. Uh, and then we'll also send you reminders. So you can come on live and answer questions live. We workshop something together to really help you advance in your goals and your plans to escape uh, the cubicle and also create a much more valuable and meaningful life uh, outside of that nine to five constraint as well. Okay. Thank you guys so much for joining me. This was lovely and uh, really lots of um, great questions today. And I can't wait to see you for next month's Q&A. Uh, and for now, um, thank you again for taking the time and I'll see you next week for our webinar. Bye.